Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Here with someone who has shattered glass ceilings, who has been a professional football running back, and who is the first, the first woman NFL coach. So it's a rare treat to have a conversation with Dr. Jen Welter. And one, thank you so much for being here in Memphis. Um, amazing to have you share your story with the youth out at Memphis Athletic Ministries and then at a big signature breakfast with 400 business leaders. But let's start with your story before we get to football with tennis. So talk about your, your love for tennis as a child. A winding road, I know. Most people don't transition directly from uh, tennis to football. And I guess I didn't go right there. But I thought I was going to be the next tennis pro. I fell in love with the game at an early age. I think as a girl, it was the one sport that you could see on TV, right? And you could see these women who I just thought were everything that a woman should be. They were beautiful and powerful and talented, and I wanted to be one. Um, I was a very good tennis player at a young age. Uh, my highest ranking was about 50 in Florida, which, you know, is, is pretty good That's from good. a national perspective. And we were going to step my game up. Right? So we were switching coaches, going to that next level coach who was supposed to be able to put me over the edge. And I told him my dream was to be a professional tennis player. And he said, because of my size and my build, I was wasting my time. Because you're five foot two. Five foot two. And I was not five foot two yet. Right. At that point, I was not even up to five foot. And I was a tiny, scrawny little kid. But I was wasting my time because I would never be strong enough to play pro tennis. And I think that that's something really important for adults to understand is that kids at that age, they don't have permission to say, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway, necessarily. You know, you're told this is an authority. This is the person that has the key to your dreams, right? This is the coach. This is the person you're supposed to look to and go to and follow, right. right? And when they say it's not possible, at least what happened to me, it was, then why am I working so hard? So my fight to go out on the courts, and I was the scrappy little thing, which hasn't changed much, but the desire to, you know, if I knew you, I would have been like, let's go play tennis right now. What can you teach me about tennis? It started to be, oh, you mean I have to go play tennis? And then eventually it became I didn't play at all. Um, thankfully, what I did do was, you know, go and start lifting weights because I didn't want anybody to tell me I'd never be strong enough again. So I was in the gym at 14 years old where most girls were not there yet and started playing a whole bunch of different sports, mostly team sports. And I found that, you know, what I couldn't do in tennis because of, you know, maybe a diminutive size, I found in a team sport because it wasn't me all by myself. So I didn't have to be the start and the end. I could be a great teammate and, you know, kind of a catalyst even within the team. And eventually all of those no's led me to playing pro football. And so when I talk to kids, I always say, maybe that coach was right. I'd never be strong enough to play pro tennis. So I just went ahead and played pro football yeah. instead. And we're a linebacker and a running back. And <laughs> you, I mean, talk about a chip on your shoulder and turning that into a, you know, an amazing career. So talk about you know, the other kind of underlying piece of this. I think the, the coach kind of telling you you're undersized and you can't do it, you know, that's one motivational piece of this. But your other is your, your father, military background, serving amazing war stories, but, but his strength really enabled you as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, everybody asks the question. They assume I had, like, you know, this football dad, right, and all of these brothers that, you know, maybe they let me play with them and then I just kept playing. It was never the case. I didn't, I didn't grow up with football heroes. I grew up with an Army hero who would tell me just what bravery was, and that was – him being um, a medic in the 1st Infantry Division of Vietnam and seeing the danger and just doing it anyway. You know, I remember him telling me, here's the problem with being a medic. Why do you think in a firefight, I think he told me the average lifespan of a medic in a firefight was 29 seconds or something like that. And I remember just looking at him and he said, Jenny, you got to remember, somebody was in a compromised position. They got shot. And you have to run to the guy who just got shot 
And by the way, you can't yeah, lay down next right. to them. You have to be up on your knees in a more compromised position. And it just always stuck with me that bravery isn't a lack of danger or not sensing it. It's just simply going into the firefight anyway because somebody else's life is important and that it's your job to to save them or protect them. And um, it, that was always my idea of what life should be like, even if it wasn't always that way. Talk about the transition to football. So when I got to college, um, I, I went to a, a first year high school. I was in the first graduating class of Fashion River High School. I was a two year captain on the soccer team. Um, I was so good and, and so cocky. You know, I, I wore number 13 because I said it was bad luck for the other team. Um, I was that kind of player. I was going to set the tone. I was the sweeper. Nothing get past, gets past me. I was the defender. And I didn't realize that being at a first year school, nobody would know to look for you. Nobody was really there to coach me and say, you know, you have to let these coaches know that you play. You have to send tape out. Uh, so no where reputation. I thought, right, where I thought I would probably go to, to college and play soccer, I didn't know enough about it. And so I didn't have that opportunity. Thankfully, um, I was a great student. I was uh, with weighted grades, the valedictorian in my class, without weighted grades, third, and I had the highest SAT scores. So my intellect and my hard work got me to Boston College where I was in their Carroll School of Management and not playing sports, I found rugby. Now I had never seen rugby before in my life. And I was like, whoa, this is like football, without the pads, it's like football meets soccer. And I just, I was like, I'm doing this. I fell in love. And I played prop in rugby, which means you're in the front row, in the trenches. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the regulators, I would say. And I became one of the best players out there. I had an opportunity to try out for the under 23 national team. And then again, at that point, I was told by the coach, she said, you know, and we played against each other all the time because she was the Harvard Radcliffe coach. So this was like, you know, an, an across the river rivalry. She said, Welter, I have players on my team who are petrified of you. They think you're insane and you're a great player. But at, at this size, in this position, I can't take you because the other players were double my size, you know, or at least 100 pounds bigger. She was like, you know, at this level, I can teach other people to do what you do, but I can't double your size. I can't take you. And so I thought my life was not going to be what I thought. You know, I, so thought, I had always again. thought I was an athlete. Right. It brought me right back to it yet again. You're too small. And so graduating college, I, I thought my dream of playing professional sports was over. Um, I, I got serious, got a real job. I remember uh, I was a headhunter. Ended up playing linebacker, not that different, but <laughs> you're both headhunters. Yeah, I mean we're both headhunters, but I didn't know it at the time, and so I get this tryout, and it's for a football team because I was playing flag football on weekends, and they called and said, "Do you have any girls playing in your flag league that could play tackle?" And I gave them one name, and it was mine. So I had this tryout, and I tell people this story all the time because. Those old voices, those old narratives came back in my head, just like they do for any one of us when you're, when you're trying to take a shot at something. And it was like, what if they tell me I'm too small again? Actually, like, here we go. What right, here if? we go. And, and I was scared, and I didn't want to get rejected again. And I almost didn't go to the tryout. I had a, that, that inner battle. And what I realized was I could, be, I could deal with being too small. I'd been too small my whole life. I could get over that. I'd done it before. But what I couldn't deal with is wondering for the rest of my life what would have happened if I would have just tried out for that football team. And I tell that pe to people because we all have that moment, right? Whether it's in sports or in business or, you know, even asking that girl out that you once had a crush on and you didn't want her to reject you, but you also, you know, had to try. And as somebody who went on to, you know, win four championships with my team, which at that time was the, the highest level you could get. And then when they had their first women's world championship, I had the honor of representing Team USA in the first and second and winning gold medals. And, you know, I think I was an eight or nine time pro bowler in my career. And then I went on to play, 
you know, a season of running back against men and um, then go into coaching and, and ultimately get a job coaching in the NFL, which none of those things were even possible. Me, just like anybody else, I could have been wondering what would have happened if I would have just tried out for that football team. And Amazing. we never want to live with, um, you no know, regrets. that wonder right. or that regret. So, Talk about the playing career because I, I think, you know, it's, it's one of those things you don't think about because you hear all the money with professional sports. But <laughs> when it comes to you winning basically the Super Bowl in your career, you got a check for about $12. Yeah, it was $12. It was my fourth season playing with my Dallas Diamonds. Right? It was, uh, we won that one in the fall of 2004. And we got Super Bowl rings in the spring and a check for $12. And it was literally a dollar a game. There was no money in women's professional football. It was technically profit sharing at the time and there were no profits. Um, and I remember the, the dollar value was obviously low but that check is still the most important check I've ever gotten because it was the first time we actually got paid to play football. It was crossing that line from you're just playing to you're a professional. Now, I usually say pro because we couldn't afford all those letters, right? We, right. You know, $12, you can't really afford the professional. So we're just going to give you pro. But the sentiment was the same and that was in the days before photo deposit so well, it was so a you choice still have that check. i still have that check and <laughs> it was it. no because it was you know now i could have taken a picture of it deposited it and kept the check then it was cash or keep it so i kept it and it was such an important check that i kept it with me at all my biggest moments and even brought it with me to uh, the arizona cardinals when i was there i just think that's such a cool storyline share the story because i think uh, paying the picture of of what you went through, I know the field conditions, the training, so much um, in parity there. But but you know one in particular where you're playing is it Team Germany and and you have the blue uniforms and they have black uniforms and you guys end up having to wear your practice jerseys. I mean, share a little bit of the story because I think it kind of paints the picture of, of of what you were up against as a female football player. Well, so you know I I'll take you a little bit before that even. So we get the call. Now, one of the best calls you could ever get in your life. Congratulations. You're going to play on the first ever women's national team. And the same call came in. You're going to play on the second women's national team. And so that was 2013 that you're referring for. So here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to take a month off work. You're going to have to fundraise for well over $3,000. And by the way, all of the, uh, the rest of your bills continue. So you're going to have to take a month off work and cut us a check for $3,000 to represent your country. Wow. It's a big difference between playing football as a woman and playing as a man. And so it, you know, you look at it now and it's painful, but I, I never even thought twice. Well, I just have to find, I have to find that money. I have to make it happen. There had never been a women's national team before, and I'm going to be a part of it. And, and we're going to open that door. We're going to set the stage for it to be better. So in 2010, we thought we were changing the world. We came back and nobody even knew we existed. So in 2013, when I made it again, it was like, all right, we're doing this the second time. It's going to be better. And it was the same conversation. Congratulations. You made the U.S. national team. Now, you're going to have to take off work, cut us a check for $3,000. And then, oh, by the way, we get to Germ We get to, it was in Vanta, Finland, the second one. And... You know, we had won our first game. We're the defending gold medalists. We're going to play. We're going to face Germany in the second round. And we were the defending gold medalists. So we didn't have home and away jerseys. We weren't supposed to. We had home advantage throughout. So we only had these dark navy blue jerseys. Well, Team, US, or Team Germany had black jerseys. And they protested our uniforms. So we wouldn't let you play. Now, Germany had their home and away, I believe. But no, it was our responsibility. And so we ended up playing our second game, which, by the way, was on the 4th of July, in our plain white practice jerseys. Those mesh jerseys you see football players practicing, we represented our country in them. No, no last names on the back. It just said, you know, USA and your number. And it was something that I, I know that we absolutely rallied around our coach did a great job of saying you know what we don't need fancy jerseys 
We don't need your names on the back. All we need to know is that we're here playing for our country. And, you know, Coach Konecki is still a great friend to this day. But we rallied around it. And on the 4th of July in Vonta, Finland, when the whole world should have been watching, but yet again, nobody knew we exist, we beat Team Germany 107 to 7. How cool is that? Yeah. <laughs> we were mad they scored, though. I wasn't on the field, though. I will say they did not score on me. And I did get in after that play because it was really early. They broke something. In the Arena League, mm -hmm. you have a chance, and, and, and we'll kind of do this in a short form, but you end up playing running back, and, you know, you have these huge guys that are basically out for blood. I mean, they're out to, to kind of prove because they don't want the narrative that this woman survives a full season. Or even, you know, anything. Right. right. And so but talk about that experience. You know, the owner brought me in and he thought it would be great for the team to um, to have me do a day of training camp with the guys. And he said it to me and I was like, oh, so you mean you want me to like run through some ladders and smiles for the camera and get you guys some great pub? And he was like, yeah, we think it'd be great. And I was like, no, absolutely not. That's an insult to me as an athlete who just won my second gold medal, by the way. And if I was anyone on the, the guys on your team, I would absolutely hate it. If you want to do anything with me and your football team, I either do everything they do step for step, hit for hit for all of training camp, or I do nothing. And it was that moment where I, I felt it. I knew I had stepped into my destiny again. I, I felt it the same way I did when I made my first football team. You know, those moments when you're truly living and you feel like the hair on the back of your neck stand up and the truth is right there and you can't deny it. I knew in that moment, the girl who shouldn't have even been able to play football, the girl who was too small, too old at that point, frankly, and too much not a running back was going to play football against men. And it came because I wasn't, I wasn't going to let them use me as a publicity stunt. I also knew that the price was really high because I might have been killed and maybe not, you know, dead, but maybe never able to walk right again. And um, the reason I was willing to do it was probably, you know, that sacrifice that my dad had taught me so many years before is that you see danger and you do it anyway. Because I knew I was stepping onto that field, not for myself, but for every single woman who I had ever played with who was fighting and clawing and scratching and saving dollars and, and passing up family time and, you know, walking fields for glass or pulling their car up on the side of the road so that we would have lights enough to practice for all of those sacrifices, for every woman who had ever wanted to play and was told nothing, I was playing for all of them. And that's when you accomplish greatness in this world, when it's not about you. When what you're doing is, is, like I say, it's playing for something bigger than yourself. Um, and that's why I was willing to do it. And the fact that I was, you know, created a whole shift on the team. And those guys taught me lessons that I will care, you know, carry with me for the rest of my life. Those guys needed to know two things. They needed to know, one, that I belonged. I was doing it for the right reasons. Right? I wasn't just going to say, oh, you can't hit me, I'm a girl. Hey. It's football. Everybody gets hit. What are you going to do when you get back up? Right? So I didn't ask for special treatment. Got hit. Got right back up. Did it again. Hey, I can do better. Even if, as I was getting tossed. Because, oh, by the way, my position up until that point wasn't running back. It was and linebacker. You were a linebacker, and they purposely moved you to running yeah. back to try to prove a point. Yeah. So I had to get tackled on every play. And, oh, by the way, in arena, this is something that's different than, you know, if you watch high school or college or pros, there is no such thing as out of bounds. I couldn't have run out of bounds if I wanted to. There's nowhere to go. You either take the ball, run with it, take your hits and get back up, or you don't do it. And those guys needed to know that. And once they knew I was there for the right reasons, they needed to know that I belonged. And the second part was we could get along, right? It wasn't going to be awkward. It wasn't going to be the you know, the typical things that we go through when, when you have an outsider versus the insider, that we could be ourselves, that we could have fun, that we could joke together. And once those two things were established, it was really pretty easy. But it was also this, and, and Clinton Solomon, who was a former NFL receiver, he played for the Chicago Bears, he taught me this lesson. He said, Jen, it's going to be hard. It was before our first practice. I said, you cannot fight against all those guys. 
cannot do it. You need a champion. You need somebody who sets the tone in the locker room. You have to let me be your champion. Because if you get in their faces like, you don't treat me like that, blah, 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 the guys will say, she doesn't need us. And it'll be you versus them. And it won't just be you versus them, but it'll be you versus them and every guy on every other team because you don't need us. Let me be your champion. And I, having been somebody who was so strong in my career, I would have been the defender in the women's teams. You know, I was the one they'd say, we need you to go make that tackle. Well, I'm going to make it. We need you to get in the backfield. Oh, I'm going to get that sack. I'm going to get that strip. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that play to be told to back up and to let somebody else be strong for me. That was tough. And I, I didn't initially trust it, but he was the kind of guy that showed me. And once he showed me, it set the tone for the entire rest of the team. You end up coaching Arena League, and then all of a sudden you hear someone, a professional coach uh, in the NFL, make a comment, and all of a sudden destiny starts to play out. So in a brief you know, bit, share the transition and how you got to become the first female NFL coach. Well, a lot of it is thanks to you know, the great work um, and pioneering of my good friend Sarah Thomas. Um, when Sarah was hired as the first full-time female ref in NFL history, somebody asked Bruce Arians, who's the head coach of the Cardinals, and by the way, I would say the coolest dude in coaching because he was smart enough to hire me, but somebody asked him in a press conference if he could ever see a female coaching in the NFL. And he said, the second a woman proves that she can make these guys hot better, she'll be hired. And so, you know, I'm coaching in arena at the time, and I talked to Devin Wyman, who was at that time the head coach about it, and I said, Dev, you know, did you hear what Bruce said? And he was a former uh, New England Patriot guy, and he was like, well, we should call Bruce. And I looked at him like he was crazy. I was like, oh, I'm just going to pick up the phone and call the NFL. He's like, yeah, can you get me his number? I thought, I don't know, maybe. And I guess I had too much time on my hands that day because I ended up going on the Cardinals website, worked my way to Bruce's assistant, Wesley, and I was not calling on behalf of myself. On that day, I was not an assistant coach. I was Devin Wyman's assistant. And I was calling on behalf of Coach Wyman, who had heard what Bruce said about a female coaching in the NFL. And he wanted Bruce to know that it may not be the NFL, but there was already a woman coaching in men's professional football. And Wes said, I think Bruce would want to take this call. So he took, Wes, he took um, Devin's number, said, I'll have him call him. Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I thought I had gotten blown off, but I was really proud of myself for like picking up the phone and calling Cardinals. I was like, oh my gosh, I just called the Arizona Cardinals, right? Like I called (laughs) an NFL team. And about two weeks later, I walked into practice and Devin was just elated. And he said, you will never guess who I talked to yesterday. Coach, I have no idea. He said, Bruce Arians. And B.A. said, tell me about this girl. So that's how it... Uh, and the rest is history. Yeah, the rest is definitely history. Well, so you do have a book. Yes. And, you know, it goes into a lot more detail on all of these stories. So share the title of the book. It's called Play Big, Lessons in Living Limitless from the First Women's Coach in the NFL. And it's, it's some of these stories because I, I feel like we learn, you know, my, my doctorate's in psychology and... You know, you can, you can tell me a fact, but a story is how we learn, right? That's how we learn in our own lives, and hopefully that's how we learn from other people. So this book is framed around sharing some of those stories and um, kind of coaching you up as if, as if I was with you and you were, like, telling me about something you were going through in your life, and I'd be like, okay, listen. So I went through this this time. <laughs> here's how I learned. And here's what happened. And it was painful, but I survived. And here's how I got back up. And so it, it really brings you into parts of my story, but it, it's very digestible. And, um, and it's, it's not X's and O's. And I think that that's something that you don't have to know football to know this. I tell people, I'm like, it's not just a football story. It's a life story. 
Mine just played out on the football field and on the sidelines. But it's, it's a story of that and how, you know, somebody who was told what I shouldn't, couldn't, and wouldn't do my whole life just couldn't listen and did it anyway, I guess. Absolutely. Dr. Jen Welter, you are an inspiration. You're a change maker. You are not only a first on a number of fronts, but you are first class. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for a conversation with Dr. Jen Welter. I didn't want anybody to tell me I'd never be strong enough again. So I was in the gym at 14 years old where most girls were not there yet and started playing a whole bunch of different sports, mostly team sports. And I found that, you know, what I couldn't do in tennis because of, you know, maybe a diminutive size, I found in a team sport because it wasn't me all by myself. So I didn't have to be the start and the end. I could be a great teammate and, you know, kind of a catalyst even within the team. And eventually all of those no's led me to playing pro football. And so when I talk to kids, I always say, maybe that coach was right. I'd never be strong enough to play pro tennis. So I just went ahead and played pro football yeah. instead. And we're a linebacker and a running back. And <laughs> you, I mean, talk about a chip on your shoulder and turning that into a, you know, an amazing career. So talk about you know, the other kind of underlying piece of this. I think the, the coach kind of telling you you're undersized and you can't do it, you know, that's one motivational piece of this. But your other is your, your father, military background, serving amazing war stories, but, but his strength really enabled you as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, everybody asks the question. They assume I had like, you know, this football dad, right? And all of these brothers that, you know, maybe they let me play with them and then I just kept playing. It was never the case. I didn't, I didn't grow up with football heroes. I grew up with an army hero who would tell me just what bravery was. And that was him being um, a medic in the 1st Infantry Division of Vietnam and seeing the danger and just doing it anyway. You know, I remember him telling me, here's the problem with being a medic. Why do you think in a firefight, I think he told me the average lifespan of a medic in a firefight was 29 seconds or something like that. And I remember just looking at him and he said, Jenny, you got to remember, somebody was in a compromised position for two yet, right? At that point, I was not even up to five foot and I was a tiny, scrawny little kid. But I was wasting my time because I would never be strong enough to play pro tennis. And I think that that's something really important for adults to understand is that kids at that age, they don't have permission to say, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway, necessarily you know, you're told this is an authority. This is the person that has the key to your dreams, right? This is the coach. This is the person you're supposed to look to and go to and follow, right. right? And when they say it's not possible, at least what happened to me, it was, then why am I working so hard? So my fight to go out on the courts and I was the scrappy little thing, which hasn't changed much, but the desire to, you know, if I knew you, I would have been like, let's go play tennis right now. What can you teach me about tennis? It started to be, oh, you mean I have to go play tennis? And then eventually it became, I didn't play at all. Um, thankfully, what I did do was, you know, go and start lifting weights. I Football with tennis. So talk about your, your love for tennis as a child. A winding road, I know. Most people don't transition directly from uh, tennis to football. And I guess I didn't go right there. But I thought I was going to be the next tennis pro. I fell in love with the game at an early age. I think as a girl, it was the one sport that you could see on TV. Right? And you could see these women who I just thought were everything that a woman should be. They were beautiful and powerful and talented, and I wanted to be one. Um, I was a very good tennis player at a young age. Uh, my highest ranking was about 50 in Florida, which, you know, is, is pretty good That's from good. a national perspective. And we were going to step my game up. Right? So we were switching coaches, going to that next level coach who was supposed to be able to put me over the edge and... 
I told him my dream was to be a professional tennis player. And he said, because of my size and my build, I was wasting my time. Because you're five foot two. Five foot two, and I was not five. Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Here with someone who has shattered glass ceilings, who has been a professional football running back, and who is the first, the first woman NFL coach. So it's a rare treat to have a conversation with Dr. Jen Welter. And one, thank you so much for being here in Memphis. Um, amazing to have you share your story with the youth out at Memphis Athletic Ministries and then at a big signature breakfast with 400 business leaders. But let's start with your story before we get to...